At the time of this video's publication, there is a portion of my online audience that is, let's just say, upset with me. Today, I want to talk about why, and then, fingers crossed, try to have a nuanced conversation about something that, in recent months, has become a bit of an internet boogeyman. AI! AI is everywhere. Artificial intelligence systems. Artificial intelligence. AI. AI art revolution. This piece of art right here, believe it or not, will was created using AI. Generated almost entirely by AI. These days, even the least talented of us can create artwork to rival Rembrandt. Generative AI is unlike any other technology that has come before. A robot made it. AI software. I have never worried about my future as an artist. Until now. AI is a tool, just like a paintbrush is a tool. I was involved. This wouldn't exist without me. Why are you trying to discredit the person behind the technology? Artificial intelligence. Holy cow. By now, you're probably sick of hearing about it. I know I certainly am. For the past year or so, advancements to general artificial intelligence programs has upended almost every facet of human life. AI has basically become the business buzzword. It's being applied everywhere, even when using the moniker is probably not entirely accurate. There's a greater discussion to be had about all the implications AI is having in things like manufacturing jobs, customer service, product marketing. My opinions on these use cases sort of vary from industry to industry, so I just want to focus on my line of work. In the creative space, generative AI programs like DAL-E and Stable Diffusion that can convert word prompts into images have gained a ton of traction. There's also the now infamous ChatGPT, an AI-powered language model. And every day, it seems like there is some new company out there releasing new tools to be used by creative types to bring an idea in their head to life. These technologies have been polarizing, to say the least, some finding them fun tools to play around with, while others believe that they are simply lazy shortcuts that rob certain industries like writers and illustrators of work, while in some cases stealing their intellectual property by way of referencing copyrighted images in their training data. What does all of this have to do with me? Well, so for the past year, I have been developing an independent 3D animated movie. Movie. It's a superhero flick based on an abandoned, now public domain comic book character named Atlas. I ran a Kickstarter last year and raised enough money to greenlight production, but 3D animation takes a lot of time, so to keep folks entertained in the meantime, I also produced two side stories featuring two other characters as a form of supplemental content for the Super Zeros, my growing cinematic universe. One of these projects was a book that I co-wrote with Elizabeth McCartney called The Spider Queen. We're really proud of it. It's an action thriller that we spent about a year on, but the thing is, I've written books before, and they typically struggle. I am forever dealing with the challenge of converting YouTube viewers to actual readers of my work, so I decided that I would put together the first chapter in an animated storybook style, with a full audio production featuring different voices, music, sound effects, the whole nine yards, and then release it totally free for people who were either on the fence about picking up a copy and checking out the whole story, or who were just looking for some something entertaining to spend about an hour watching. The budget for books, especially independently published ones, is typically quite small. I did not have a lot of money to spend on it, and all of what I did have went toward paying Elizabeth, the co-author, as well as professional editing, proofreading, formatting, and commissioning artists for the book's cover design, as well as a few marketing materials. Audiobook production typically costs a lot of money too, and they take time to develop. Spider Queen's Audible version is still in production through Amazon's professional services, and even when it's finished, it can only really be listened to on their exclusive platform. But I understand that not all of my viewers have the ability to afford a book or an Audible subscription, so I figured that this storybook video would just be a great way to let everybody experience some of the Spider Queen story 
free of charge. If it was popular enough, maybe I could just do the rest of the book like this. Shortly after releasing the video, however, the backlash began with accusations that the video was produced from unethical AI image generation. These are the negative comments that I received from various viewers. I put them on the screen now because I honestly want everybody who left negative feedback to know that I took the time to read every single one of those comments and really consider what they had to say. I'll be reading quite a few of these on camera too, so stick around, you might be one of the lucky ones. So like, as I see it, all of the negative comments seem to focus on three main pillars of contention. The use of AI is lazy. I should have hired illustrators. Using AI steals said illustrator's work without their permission. I'd like to take a look at these three criticisms because I now have some reflections. This is gonna be a long one, sorry. YouTube user Fezhov commented, This video is an absolute embarrassment. The obvious use of AI in both visuals and narration is just so disappointing, especially coming from a creative. And doing so to promote your own creative work, you had to put a couple hours into editing this together, reading the base script out to feed into the narration AI, and rendering the video, and not once did the irony of what you were doing hit you, Frankly, at that point, I wouldn't be surprised if a majority of your book was AI written, with a couple of touch-ups thrown in by your own hand. Take the video down and improve, because this is awful. Misleading, even. There is a good handful of people here in the comment section saying they've purchased your book who very clearly believe they're being sold a graphic novel slash comic, when in reality what you're selling is a text-only piece of literature. Now, I'm not quite sure about that last part. I have looked through every single comment on that video, and I could not find a single one from anyone saying they thought they were buying a comic. But even if I did somehow miss it, I think I have made it like a bunch abundantly clear that the Spider Queen is a novel. I mean, it even clearly says so on the purchase page. But setting that aside, back to Fezhov's main complaint, that the video is lazy. Several negative comments referenced this idea that to produce this storybook video, all I really did was just type some words into some magic AI program, throw the results onto a timeline, click the make movie button, and a couple of hours later, voila, the video was done. I wish, I wish it was that easy. Those actually familiar with animation and video production of course understand that this assertion is anything but the truth. This is the original project file for the Spider Queen storybook. You'll note that it was created over five months before the video's eventual release. That's because I worked on this video for five months. This was not some slap together thing made in a weekend. It took longer to make than most of my fully animated YouTube videos. So let's break it down. The Spider Queen's main character, Shannon Kane, is an adult female. The story is told mostly from her perspective. And if there is one thing I have learned over the years, it's that when the main character is female, it generally goes better if the voice performing that character is also female. So I should just hire a female voice actor, right? Well, I tried. I held three separate rounds of auditions, but I honestly, I just didn't like any of the submissions that much. And I was also quoted recording rates that were like way, way higher than what my budget would allow for this. Around this time, a fellow YouTuber introduced me to Eleven Labs, a text-to-speech engine that's recently been making waves online. Text-to-speech technology has been around forever, and I actually didn't think that it would be good for a narrative project, but I tried the software out anyway, and lo and behold, it actually wasn't that bad. Honestly, I thought I was going crazy, so I did a test with a focus group comparing the top 10 voice narrator auditions with the AI tossed into the mix. I am not making this up. Everybody picked the AI voice as being the best version. None of them knew that it wasn't real. It was preferred over the real world auditions. It was the only option that I could afford, and the voice used is licensed by the company, so everybody involved is being fairly compensated seemed like a no-brainer to me but as fez hoof comments it's still lazy right like all i did was just copy and paste the book's text into the program hit generate and we're done right 
Yeah, no. <laughs> Text to speech is not perfect. Inflection and pronunciation can be all over the place, and oftentimes I had to generate specific lines over 30 times before finding a good take, especially if it was dialogue with heavy emotion. Henry, Henry, are you okay? Henry, Henry, are you okay? Henry, Henry, are you okay? This is a timeline of the over 1,000 audio generations that I personally had to Frankenstein together over the course of 25 hours of editing. That's just the narration. On top of that, there were, of course, dozens of hours spent sourcing royalty-free music and sound effects, all in an effort to make a fully-fledged audio production. I spent weeks on the sound mix to try and get it up to quality, and it's not perfect, believe me, I understand that, but to suggest that this is something that anybody out there can replicate in just a couple of hours with a generative AI is not a fair assessment at all. That's just the audio, but of course the main contention seems to be with the visuals. Ultima Fortress commented, sorry, but the AI generated images and almost definitely voices from what it sounds like on a sponsored video to promote your book just feels gross. And this throws the whole project into question. Like, how can we know AI wasn't used to write the book itself? And all for this public domain comic character multimedia project that I guess the channel is just about now. Each piece on its own would be whatever, I guess, but all of this has the air of wanting quick results. I know making stuff is hard. Your channel has shown what a struggle it can be, like with films and your previous book, and I felt for you there, but the whole direction of this channel has had this undercurrent to it, from the AI to the royalty-free stuff that started out as a kind of funny joke turned into, oh, he's really committed to the bit, isn't he? We're seriously still doing this? You're capable of better and more ethical content than this. But maybe content should be it. Leave the art to the artists. Pepsiman3535, this is shameful. You should delete this video and apologize for taking extreme shortcuts. Samwell7259, this video required zero labor since the entire video is AI generated. Sam actually left a lot of comments. You can do this video in a day, since AI doesn't require artistry, creativity, or labor. Every ounce of this video is AI generated. There's so much more, but you get the idea. Again, the contention is, Austin just lazily typed prompts into a computer and the AI made the video. If you actually watch the video, then you will know that this cannot possibly be the case. The storybook features various animation effects and motion graphics that were not AI generated. They were painstakingly crafted or added by me in a non-linear editor. Who calls it a non-linear editor anymore? The visuals for the Spider Queen storybook were produced using a variety of resources, including 2D art and character designs I commissioned or drew myself, 2D and 3D assets I purchased from royalty-free stock footage websites, generative fill and neural art filters available in either Photoshop or Adobe Firefly, which is an AI trained only on stock images owned by the company, public domain content, or other openly licensed or non-copyright material, keep that in mind, we'll come back to it later, and a diffusion model trained on the above materials. I have been using most of these resources my entire video career. Most YouTubers do. These tools allowed me to produce an over 50 minute storybook that simply would not have been possible otherwise. Now, can people use AI generators to make lazy art? Sure, absolutely. But the video that I produced could not have been replicated, as some have suggested, in a couple hours by a computer. It required a heavy and overwhelming human involvement, at the very least to write the actual book, but certainly to create this entire production. This shot here is a great example. We've got a generative fill background that was produced using a royalty-free 3D environment combined with 3D and 2D royalty-free assets using commissioned art with alterations I 
I hand drew, all of it composited together and animated by me in Adobe After Effects, where I added camera movement, color correction, focus effects, timed it to royalty-free music that I have licensed and curated, featuring sound effects from a stock library with reverb and mixing that I did, integrating a vocal performance that I meticulously constructed. If you believe that this method of video production is lazy content, all I can do is just share these screenshots of the final project timeline with you and tell you that this video took way longer to put together than I ever would have anticipated. And if you think that this is something that anybody with an AI program can do, I welcome you to try and replicate it yourself in a couple of hours. But Austin, if it really did require all of this effort, why not just commission artists to make it for you? And to that I respond, with what money? Marvel Studios caught a lot of flack recently over the opening credits of their Disney Plus exclusive Secret Invasion. They used AI art in the production of the visuals, and several news articles and blogs took them to task for using computers for this instead of just hiring artists to make original material. Marvel Studios then responded to the backlash by pointing out that they had hired artists to create this intro, and that the artists had elected to use the AI-assisted tools because of the otherworldly aesthetic that they offered and to lessen the workload on already stressed VFX teams, and that the AI images were merely a part of an overall transformative title sequence that involved several different departments, all of which were paid for their time and services. There is definitely a separate discussion to be had about large-scale TV and movie studios with seemingly bottomless budgets taking AI shortcuts as a way to undercut artists' and creatives, shout out to the recent writer's strike and actor's strike, I am not Marvel Studios. I am an independent creator experimenting with technology to do his best to make neat and affordable stuff before he dies because, because telling stories is fun. The main point of contention for some seems to be that the storybook animation, if I was going to do it, should have been done by either doing it all myself without any computer assistance or paying illustrators for every single frame. Setting aside the fact that I did commission some of the elements used in this video and have, in fact, commissioned several artists and creatives throughout the entire Super Zeros project, I just want to say that, that I think the idea that expecting independent YouTube creators to only create things if they are financially able to, like, hire professionals for every element of the video is a bit unreasonable. In a creative ecosystem that thrives off of remix, reinterpretation, and recontextualization, how far are we really going to take this? I paid for access to Adobe Firefly, whose neural filter plugins, brushes, and generative fill tools are all accomplished through licensed means. Even the diffusion models used for reference in many character illustrations were trained using 3D characters that I paid a license for. I have have legal permission to remix and reuse these royalty-free elements using whatever creative or technical methods I wish. <laughs> That's why they're called royalty-free, right? <laughs> If this art is AI generated, there's zero chance of me purchasing your book. The absolute least you could do is hire a working illustrator if you're going to make a promotion like this to increase sales. I'd rather you commission an artist to do this. Why not reach out to freelance artists? But the thing is, I did. Before Adobe Firefly ever came on the scene, I actually reached out to various freelance artists to see if anyone would be willing to take on an over 50 minute animation project and when I tried to reach out I was either turned down because the scope of the project was too big or because the prices that those illustrators quoted me were like way outside the budget that I had available. This is not stingy multi-million dollar movie company refuses to pay artists and decides to use AI instead. This is independent author and YouTube creator 
can't afford to spend five figures on what is ostensibly a trailer for his book that will barely make four figures when it is published. Some commenters suggested that even if I couldn't afford to pay a team of illustrators, I should have just reached out to the community to see if anyone would be willing to work on this project for free. And with respect to that, I say, ew. Can you imagine how bad it would have looked if I had used my audience's labor without compensation? Look, I did the whole working for exposure thing when I was growing up, and now that I'm an adult, I can fully see how like just totally gross that is. And I do not want to perpetuate a practice that is to me actually exploitative. So I couldn't afford to pay illustrators for every single frame of the video, and I could not ask illustrators to work for free. What do I do? And for many, the answer seems simple. Don't make anything. Many have commented, if you couldn't do it the right way, then don't do it at all. And to that attitude, I must respectfully disagree. I don't feel comfortable being on the side that just outright discourages creation altogether, or like dictates the terms in which creativity ought to be explored. Because I feel like history has shown that gatekeeping art and stifling new technology never works out too well. You'd expect that Austin, being a writer, would understand the moral issues regarding AI, but nope, off he goes to AI to make the video much cheaper and faster, robbing artists of their work and living. Austin, do better. It's people who try stuff like this that are the death of art. You are literally robbing people of their livelihood. Educate yourself because this isn't cool. So condescension and passive aggressive attitudes aside, I totally do understand this perspective. Look, I get it. A big argument against using AI in any way, shape or form is that it robs others of potential work. And in kindness, I just want to ask people with that perspective, how far do you want to take that? Because illustrators, animators, editors, YouTubers, and filmmakers use digital shortcuts like every day to make their visions easier to produce, and most likely you don't even realize it. Like Descript, for instance, is a popular YouTube and podcast editing tool that allows you to have an AI double overdub flubbed lines from your recording. It can automatically transcribe your videos, which help several creators to quickly turn around captions for people with auditory disorders or who don't know the creator's native language. This makes creative works of art now available to tons of people who otherwise wouldn't be able to experience it. But for sure, it puts transcribers out of business. And there's stuff like Gleeing. It's an AI editor that automatically removes dead air and bad takes from video recordings, one of the most time-consuming and dull parts of editing. Most of the major YouTubers have been using these kinds of tools for a while now without any objection because it's convenient. It helps take like a five-hour boring editing session and turn it into a 20 minute boring editing session, which is like better, right? But the thing is like, is that unethical? I mean, are they hurting freelance editors by not hiring them instead for that? And here's the thing, what if they decide, you know what, I'm gonna not use the AI, I'm gonna pay 10 times the price and I'm gonna actually hire a human editor. What if the editor that they pay just uses that AI anyway? <laughs> because I guess it's a dirty secret, but there are tons of illustrators out there. There are tons of editors out there. There are tons of audio engineers out there who are using these AI assisted tools in their toolbox to save themselves time and to get more work. Because when you are creating original works, you value time-saving tools. Like for years, for years, I have used 2D and 3D stock elements in my videos, combining and remixing them with a variety of resources to create some of my most popular works. Where is the line drawn for when these creative tools become unethical? Here's an email I got from a guy, we're just gonna call him Rex. I think it illustrates perfectly what it is I'm trying to say. As someone who has been a fan of yours for several years, I'm deeply disappointed at your excuse for a video. The entire video, the art, the movement, the voice, every single ounce of it was made using soulless AI tools. Not only does this leave a bitter taste in my mouth for the video itself, 
it makes me question my support of the entire project, wondering what other AI shortcuts you plan to take. How much of the novel was written by AI? How much of the movie will you use a computerized tool for rather than actual artists? It makes me second guess my support of the entire process and makes me deeply disappointed in you as a content creator. Rather than supporting artists and voice actors who you could have given this project to, or indeed not making the video at all if you had no intention of doing it right, you spat this at us and expected us to accept it. I can either get an apology or a refund, but I will be getting one or the other. Yikes. So this sentiment is actually really interesting to me for a number of reasons. First, the perspective that just because someone may use an AI-assisted tool for something in an overall creation, then that creation necessarily loses all human effort. But secondly, notice like how the goalpost shifts to this idea that creative merit is somehow lost if any part of any creative work uses any computerized tool in lieu of an artist. <laughs> I really don't know what to do with this. Like, Atlas the Animated Movie uses a ton of computerized tools. It's literally a movie built upon computer animation. But does that somehow mean that, like, using digital assistance robs it of value or creative effort? The 3D models used throughout the Atlas movie are not all made by me. Some of them are commissions, some of them are royalty free, some of them are like image scans because I can't model very well, but I can take an image reference and then use AI to save time in the modeling process. This happens in practically like every video game or 3D animated movie. For sure, I could hire a 3D modeler to produce all of these assets all custom, but I can't afford that. And even if I could, here again is the dirty little secret, most of those modelers will probably just end up using the same AI tool that I would have used. Because it's a tool, right? It's just something that you keep in your toolkit. It helps make the creation process easier. Like this email mentioned uncertainty about whether or not my book used computer-assisted tools. It does. I use Grammarly all the time because it's a computer algorithmic tool that can easily detect spelling and grammar mistakes. It can give me suggestions on how to improve readability. It I mean, I can't remember the last time someone debated the ethical merits of using a computer-assisted spell checker. In fact, I know for certain that the proofreaders and the professional editors that I have hired on my books in the past use Grammarly too. Is that unethical? I honestly, I just don't get this. Like, just because a computer does heavy lifting in some areas, doesn't make the entire collective final creation somehow soulless, right? Like, here's an example. One of the most difficult parts of this whole Atlas movie has been character animation. It takes a lot of time to make these 3D models move and speak in a convincing way. Animators routinely use motion capture AI to do a lot of that work. I sometimes will use pre-made animations as a base and then make personalized tweaks as needed for each specific scene or specific use case. Oftentimes, I'll use references to get a particular set of poses that I want a character to perform, and then I'll use a keyframing tool in which an AI interpolates the in-betweening. This is all computer-assisted, and these tools are used in practically all animated movies that you see on television and in movie theaters. So again, like, where is the line supposed to be drawn? I mean, look, you're, you are absolutely free to say, hey, look, I have ethical problems with these production methods. That's fine, you can have that opinion, but you might just also ask, am I being consistent in this methodology? It just seems weird to me to suggest that I shouldn't be allowed to use certain tools to bring my vision to life because hypothetically, it could be accomplished in different and more difficult ways that are outside of my ability to realize. I know it seems like a cliche argument that you've probably heard before, but again, I mean, it is worth asking, do we outlaw calculators because mathematicians might lose work? Am I not allowed to use a Photoshop brush because I could have just commissioned a painter to do it by hand? Like, if I want to zoom my camera in for emphasis, are the keyframes that the computer generated for that move unethical because 
I should have just hired a camera person? The reality is, Rex, that creators use AI-assisted tools every day in ways you don't even realize. Like, when you watch a major TV show, the audio engineer likely used some kind of computer-assisted tool to help boost or improve the audio clarity of something recorded on set. Virtually all major podcasts or video creators use some of these computer-assisted tools in their workflows, and if they didn't, you might actually hate the result. Honestly, at some point, it has got to just be okay to stop worrying about how the sausage is made and just enjoy the hot dog. Having now said all of that, the most convincing argument I think that AI opponents have is the idea that these diffusion models are trained on copyrighted works. That is a much larger issue that deserves a discussion in its own right, and honestly, it's one that I am not really comfortable having yet because I'm still learning. I was told a lot of things by the AI bad crowd early on that, upon further investigation, is not actually an accurate reflection of how these technologies work. Now, my current understanding is that these AI image generators diffuse reference images into essentially noise to detect patterns for various objects, so that, for instance, when you tell it to make an apple cartoon style, it looks through millions and millions of these diffused data sets of apple and tries to figure out what the correct contours, colors, and textures are for that specific object. Then it runs that through various neural filters to find an acceptable style, which the user can then choose from and further modify on their own if they so choose. I don't know that that process actually violates copyright. For sure, I can totally understand how someone might see it differently, but to me, there seems to be a lot of transformation going on in that process. I think could be wrong. I've actually done my best to try and read a lot of the literature, and I admit that I might be misinterpreting the process, but the point is I'm actually looking into this, and I'm trying to think about it logically, and not just making like a snap judgment based on what other people have told me about this new technology. There is a discussion to be had about how these new tools interplay with our current attitude toward intellectual property. For sure, if you specifically train an AI on a set of images, it will do its best to lean into that image's specific style. But setting aside the can of worms that is, can you copyright a style, let me just reiterate again that for the Spider Queen storybook, AI models were either trained on images I personally drew, or commissioned, or licensed, or were produced through an AI that the company claims has only been trained on images that were public domain, or that they have specifically paid a license for. This, I think, at least currently, is the most ethical method for using generative fill software. So here's the question, is it okay for me to use fillers and filters if those reference materials have all been properly licensed by myself or a stock software company? But if even that use case is off limits, then we really need to consider how consistent we want to be with that barometer. Leonardo da Vinci traced the outline for the Mona Lisa. Michelangelo used human models for his paintings. Rembrandt used camera obscura. As technology develops, so do the artists using them. Norman Rockwell projected photographs onto a canvas and then painted over them. Comic book artists have used light boxes for years. The late great Neil Adams unashamedly traced photographs for his work, even modern illustrators use Photoshop and Illustrator or other software with reference material to recreate, modify, and manipulate said images to create original works. If it's okay for human artists to use reference images that they then add their own stylistic flair to, and if it was okay for human artists to use emerging technologies of their time to help them advance in their own artistic abilities, where do we draw the line for today? Because there is a world of difference between typing in the prompt, make a yellow banana, then taking that image without modification and using it to sell a line of t-shirts, and using royalty-free visual and audio assets as the building blocks for a fully produced, mixed, and transformed work. Like, as an outside observer, again, let's 
think about this like grown-ups. Let's approach this subject with understanding and with nuance rather than making these broad and brash judgments. There is clearly a spectrum between these two extremes. Can we at least agree that it is disingenuous to equate the two? Honestly, it feels to me like AI has become a sort of boogeyman that people just see around every corner. Last month, I produced a video featuring the original Spider Queen comic book from 1941, and several people in the comments asked if that comic's illustrations were AI, since they supposedly had like telltale signs, like the proportions were off, or the hands or faces looked wonky. When in reality, I was literally just showing them the panels from the original comic. I mean, you can check it out online if you don't believe me. That's just what the comic looked like back then. Plenty of stories are popping up of illustrators who are being accused of using AI when it turns out that they actually didn't. As human works and AI-assisted works start becoming more and more difficult to distinguish, honestly, how far are we wanting to go with this? At this point, it's probably worth asking if some critics of AI are actually interested in the complexity of this subject, or if they are just looking for a way to feel morally superior to others. I'm super pleased with the Spider Queen book and the various people that helped put it together. And as for the Spider Queen's free storybook preview, I'm thankful that it gave me a chance to experiment with emerging technologies and the potential that they have to allow independent and upcoming creators the opportunity to share their stories to a wider audience of people than ever before. As this technology develops, let's continue to have spirited yet charitable discussion about the potentials that it might have for the next generation of artists and storytellers. I know there is a tendency in online discourse to just be like hyper cynical and to snarkily make snap judgments about people without really picturing them complexly. Even if you disagree with some of my thinking about this subject, and by the way, you are totally, totally free to. Try to remember, though, that I'm a person, right? Like, I'm a guy. I'm a guy who has his own struggles and his own insecurities, his own shortcomings, and I'm just trying to make cool stuff while I have the time to make it and use the tools that I have available to me. I was a little jarred by the comments, some of which were from people who have actually been subscribed and have enjoyed my work for years, just like immediately talking down to me like I'm some kind of reprobate, and not only attacking my creation, but also attacking my character without even giving me so much as a fair hearing. Look, just blanketly assigning malice to another person's intent because the internet told you to, I know that that can feel gratifying in the moment. I'm well aware that there are those of you out there who fundamentally just disagree with all AI, regardless of the use case, regardless of the scope. If it involves AI at all, it's gotta be unethical. AI bad, right? And I want you to understand that I get it. I really honestly do, but I would hope that you are willing to at least consider that things in life are rarely black and white, and that while some technology can rob humans of creativity, more often than not, history has shown that it actually tends to enhance it. When I was growing up in the aughts, I remember having this professor who was like your typical old stick in the mud. He taught film theory, and he routinely discouraged all of his students from pursuing this new emerging technology, digital cameras. He spent semester after semester drilling into our heads that using a digital camera wasn't real filmmaking, that real filmmakers knew how to shoot on film, how to manually expose images, how to manually focus, how to manually white balance, and even how to manually develop and splice together film stock. To him, using a digital camera or a computer that did any of those things automatically would never be taken seriously in the industry, and they would never ever count as real art. To my knowledge, he worked on one motion picture in his entire life as an assistant focus puller in his 20s. And although he talked endlessly about various movie ideas that he had, he left this world having never made any of them because if it wasn't shot on film, it was cheating. I think about that professor a lot. 
This video has been sponsored by Squarespace. They can help you put together a beautiful website in no time. Start by choosing from one of their stunning customizable templates and then use their new Fluid Engine to shape it to your specific needs. Use member areas to host exclusive video content and if you've got something to sell, their online storefront can get you up and running in no time. Head to squarespace.com to start a free trial today. Give it a shot, then when you're ready to launch your site in full, head over to squarespace.com slash austinmcconnell to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.